Hello, my name is Jupiter Hadley, and let me introduce you to the unofficial Game Maker Meetup, a monthly meetup event where we have talks around the many aspects of game development in general, as well as with Game Maker Studio, along with casual discussions and socializing with game developers. The meetup is organized and run in our spare time by Quang DX of Asobi Tech, Juju Adams, and myself, Jupiter Hadley. More info can be found on Twitter at GMM Meetup or Facebook on the unofficial Game Maker Meetup group. Here's one of our wonderful talks. Hello, welcome to part two of GM Meetup number 10. Uh, we now have Jade asking for more scary wallpapers, please. Please. Uh, which is a talk about audio and game audio in horror games. Yes. So I'm following. Um, <laughs> yes. If you have any photos, second photos, whatever, um, copy, um, what should we call it? Use the, use the hashtag GM Meetup. Sorry, I'm all over the Anyway. I'm now going to go sit down. Jay, take it away. Right. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay if I talk at this, this level? Okay. Um, so I'm Jade. Um, I write music and I do sound design and consultations. Um, I write under JD Wasabi. So that's my Twitter handle. Oh, I'm going to use this here. <laughs> this is so good. So... In this talk, I will be talking about game audio in general, mostly for horror games and all that, but all the theory around it can be used for other games at, or non-horror games because you still need audio. Um, feel free to kind of tweet to me and, and use the hashtag MSW, please. So basically, more scary wallpaper, please. Um, so if you don't have any questions now, feel free to tweet to me or use the hashtag. And I can reply back on Twitter later because I, I know sometimes it's a bit like, oh, this talk is great or I have questions, but you can't actually articulate it right here, right now in the talk setting. So do feel free to be on your phones in my talk. Um, so a little, about, a little bit about myself, um, I do specialize in horror audio and East Asian music compositions, um, so that's, that's kind of like my jam, but I also write in some different styles as well. It's not my best work, but I am going to give it a go. Anyway, so let's give this a go. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, I when I play a lot of horror games, I find that it's usually kind of just focusing on a lot of really cheap jump scares, which actually doesn't do anything for me. I've been playing a lot of horror games and watching a lot of horror films now, so I'm basically very immune to jump scares or, like, I'll just find it really boring. So if you want to create a game experience that... Um, that is meaningful for your players, then I'm going to talk about some kind of tips and techniques with what you can do around your game design. So can I just have a quick show of hands about who who is like really into audio? I, I know you are. <laughs> yeah, audio, audio. Yay, audio people. Um, is everyone else like just general game designers and programmers? Yeah, yeah. Or, or game science programs? Okay, all right. So I will tailor my talk more for the game design aspect, basically. Okay, so I'm going to talk over here now just to change things up. So what is the horror experience? Um, we could break it down into two different kind of aspects. So we can look at it from a biological aspect or we can look at it more from a psychological aspect. So there are different ways in which we can experience fear, terror, or adrenaline, or, or whatever. So um, biologically, we have the brainstem reflex. So this is your flight or fight response. So if something scary happens or something unexpected happens, you'll, you'll instantly kind of feel like, okay, you can either deal with it now or run away. Um, in game audio, or audio in general, um, just like we, we don't have any earlids, so that means even now we are constantly on an alert for anything scary or dangerous that might happen. So for example, if something falls down and we'll be like, oh, <laughs> kind of like, what was that? Um, it's the same when we're sleeping, actually, because when we sleep, um, obviously we are unconscious, but if there is a loud noise or something shifts around the environment, our ears will be able to de detect it, unless obviously we are 
really in deep sleep and we can't hear our alarm kind of thing. Um, there are a few other biological responses. So for example, you, you sweat, you, you feel like really energetic, you have the adrenaline rush, um, things like that. You, you feel like definitely a, a lot more alert, for example. So those are like kind of the physical experiences that we can all have. Um, the the psychological, oops, psychological aspects over here is a little bit different. Um, I've only read up on like a few different papers on how we can react to audio, sounds, and music, but I'll try to be really basic here so that we can all be on the same page. Um, so evaluative um, conditioning is where we, in a game audio sense, we train players to react in a certain way. So for example, in Silent Hill, has everyone played Silent Hill? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So Silent Hill um, kind of introduces to the players that, oh, if you hear radio static, that usually means there is a monster nearby. So when you hear it later on in the game, you automatically know like, okay, I'm ready, or I'm ready to run or fight or whatever. So you can use this in your game design where you can really play around with that once you teach the players what to look out for or rather hear out for, if that makes sense. Um, so emotional contagion uh, terminology, but it basically means that if you hear a particular type of music, you usually mimic that expressive emotions. For example, if I start playing some sad music, everyone will be feeling like, oh. <laughs> if I start to play like, I don't know, dance music, it's really energetic, then then yeah, you might feel a little bit more upbeat and energetic and like, oh, this is nice and happy, whatever. So next slide. <clears throat> okay, so what I really like about game audio is that we have a lot of overcross with film theory and sound design. Um, so just basic film theory over there. So diegetic music and sound, where the audio source is visible on the screen and the viewer. Non-diegetic music sound is where the audio source is not visible on screen. So there are ways in which we can play with what the viewer or the players can see and not see on your screen. So obviously we can apply it to mobile gaming, big kind of screens like this, cinema, and, and all that. It, it really depends on visuals, basically. And now we're gonna get onto the fun part. Oh yeah, so the, the why I call this talk uh, More Scary Wallpapers, please, is because this is a scene from a really old movie called The Haunting. Yes, it, it was made in like 1960 something, a black and white film. Nothing actually happens in this particular scene. You have the main character, minor spoilers if you're like 80 years late or whatever. Um, you have the main character who's hearing a lot of weird noises in, in her bedroom. So obviously she's like freaking out. Um, but the camera is just focusing on this weird patch of wallpaper here. And then the camera just like kind of zooms in on this bit of the wallpaper and you just hear all these really weird noises and stuff. And I have to say, this was the scene in which freaked me out the most. So it was so effective, much more so than like jump scares, actually seeing monsters or ghosts. And you know, that, that really stuck with me. So this is the kind of like effect I want to kind of share this experience of everyone here as designers, as storytellers, um, as musicians and artists. Um, yeah, no, it's just great. <laughs> okay. Right. So as designers, coders, um, musicians, artists, we are all working collaboratively on a narrative timeline, for example. It can be a gameplay timeline, um, emotional journey timeline, um, gameplay timeline, let's just say. So th there was always like, the timeline will always start the moment you start a game, for example, and it will always end when you close the app or save and exit the game, for example. So we need to be, oops, we need to be like really aware of what is happening in the past and then in the present and then in the future. 
Right, so this is our like kind of like timeline over there. Am I making sense so far? Okay, great. <laughs> so what makes gameplay actually really fun or really boring is, I would say, the emotional intensity timeline. So if nothing is really happening or like gameplay is meh or whatever, then it will usually just like stay at a constant level here. But if your game design is good and the game audio can help elevate it, usually oops, usually this kind of emotional intensity will go up and down throughout the game, for example. So this is a really basic graph that I've drawn here. Um, it doesn't need to be like um, a scene before in, say, like a narrative game. It can be literally a few seconds before or like previously, previous games even. Um, so we can break everything down into an emotional journey. Um, this present area here, again, it can be um, the current mission in a game, it can be the current narrative scene, or it can be like actually what is literally happening right now this second. Um, the same can be said for like the next scene over here, what is going to happen in the future. So what will happen immediately afterwards, what will happen in the next scene, what will happen in the next level, then we can definitely play with um, players' emotions and their kind of game design emotional journey way. I hope that makes sense. I, I'm just blabbing. Sorry if I'm not. Do interrupt me if I'm not making any sense. Um, yeah, so as I've written down here, it, this kind of applies both to games and films, but if, say, like you are a storyboard artist, a, a writer even, this is something that you want to have a think about and possibly use this kind of lens to look at your own work. <clears throat> right, so this is where it gets really interesting because when I was researching this many, many years ago, I found specific little tidbits of information which makes um, kind of audio just really exciting in general for me. So, so non-musical sounds generally induce a negative emotion, emotion of, uh, emotional response. So there is more feelings of anxiety and fear. Um, I'm basing these... Um, kind of little nuggets of facts um, based on music psychology kind of experiments that, that were done. Um, and basically in this, uh, I would say, yeah, uh, experiment, people did say that they felt more negative emotions uh, when they hear stuff like car noises, um, building work type noises, and general kind of ambient type sounds, for example, as opposed to music, where if, say, like, we'll, we'll put on some, some music now, people generally associate music with feeling happy. Um, so that is something you can definitely play around with your design. So human hearing is naturally more sensitive to high frequencies, therefore it's perceived worse than it actually is. So high frequencies, if we look at um, an audio waveform, um, it is made of like really high stuff and really low stuff. Combined together, it would change the quality and tonal sound of that sound. So we are kind of inbuilt, we have inbuilt responses to these type of sounds. So if we hear like crying babies or squeaky doors, we naturally kind of sit upright because that is usually the sound of danger or something that we should take note of. Um, on, the, on the opposite end of the scale, so certain frequencies resonate with different parts of the body. For example, 65 hertz affect the lower back region. So this is why cinema is really great because you can really hear like loads of deep rumbly sounds and you can like actually, I, I don't know if you can all feel it, but I personally feel like, oh, I can kind of like feel something being affected here. Uh, when there's like really low rumbly basses and if there's something really high pitch, I can, I do kind of like feel it. I, I don't know, there's a weird fuzzy feeling like up here, up here. I don't know how, how else to explain it. But this is why like if you can actually work with composers, sound designers, um, audio people, if you want to have like a really, really impactful 
kind of gameplay moments with your games. Um, working with a sound designer uh, can like really bring that kind of experience to your games. Obviously, it's a bit difficult when your game is like, say, like a mobile game or like people don't actually have a huge surround system. You, you know, we, we had to like work with whatever people can actually have. Um, but it's, it is something that you, you may want to kind of work with and just have a play around if you want to like create a really big grand experience, basically. I have more facts on my website, by the way, so I, I won't go too in depth into that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, several techniques or principles which you may want to consider. Uh, right. Cool, okay, right. So always, always, always aim for complete immersion. This is more for kind of horror audio stuff or the horror games in general, but basically general rule of thumb if you have a really good fully immersive game experience, you generally have a better experience. Um, whoops, wrong button. So yeah, it's if you have a better experience, you have a better kind of playing field in terms of building up intensity or building tension and building scares. Um, the, well, frictional games, they have a really good in-depth kind of blog post around this, which I won't go into into this talk, but the link is there and you can always tweet to me if you want to have that URL, U, URL link. There we go. <clears throat> right, to give meaning to the audio. Um, once you give mean, meaning to the audio, this becomes communication. So what I come across usually in a lot of game design documents is that People just gen generally like to say, oh, yeah, we need a sound sound effect here. We need like a background music somewhere. Um, sometimes there is like no thought put around it because every time I put in an asset into a game, um, I literally need to tell the player something through that asset. So why, why are we having like, let's say, five different user interface type sounds, for example. Um, why can we not just have maybe two? Uh, one sound effect can be a confirmation type sound. The other sound effect can be a negative type, like, oh, this is wrong sound. So already, I've already kind of explained or told the player in a way that like, yeah, what you have chosen there is correct, or what you have chosen over here is wrong. If you have too many, that would definitely, definitely confuse players because every time they hear a sound like that, <laughs> you know, they, they, it's, it's, we, we all react to it, right? <laughs> we, we all react to it in certain ways. Um, it's the same as when you're like, you know, playing a game and then you hear the battle music coming on, but you don't, you can't see the enemies and you're like, wait, what? Why? Uh, the battle music is telling me to like get ready for like the battle kind of, experience of the game, but if there's no enemies, then you're all really confused, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the same with this. Um, the reason why I put this blue show over here is, is that it's just a sound effect. It's the washing sound effect, but every time you hear it, you start to panic. Has everyone here played Mario Kart, by the way? Okay, good, good. So, so yeah, so obviously if you're in first place, um, the, the player in first place will panic the most but everyone else will be like, yes, this is a good sound effect to hear. So yeah, give meaning to the audio and don't bombard your design or don't bombard the players with lots of random sound effects for no reason. Same with music. Right, this is like my favorite part, silence. Silence is really, really underrated in games. Um, this is why I really like horror games in general, just because they use silence really well. Most of them. Silent Hill, mostly. <laughs> um, so with silence, it subverts the emotional contagion. So we as players, we've been conditioned to mimic musical expressions. And, you know, we, we panic if we have nothing to follow. 
and oops, this is a formatting issue. We we freak out. We we can freak out players because the lack of audio communication is now open to interpretation. So if say like you enter a room and it's suddenly nothing there, what should you do? It's um, players rely so much on audio as a source of communication that we can really mess around with the whole audio experience and that's what makes it fun. <clears throat> Bless you. Um, so yeah, we can, we can kickstart the brainstem reflex. So remember I talked about the flight or fight response. If we hear nothing, then what should we do? Are we, are we going to fight or do we need to run away? We don't know. So the absence of sound is the absence of life. Silence is a reminder that you are alone. What are you? We don't know, because that's, that's why it's so great. <laughs> it's really ambiguous. But silence technically has its own sound and creates the environmental space, e.g. room tones. Um, so in a way, like now, we can hear the projector. We can hear bits of what's happening outside. And we can hear ourselves as well, Clo clothes rustles and all that. It's really, really interesting when you let things settle. But we can also use silence to our advantage and our design. So any sound followed by silence is interpreted by the brain to be bigger than it is, which creates a bigger and more lasting impression. The reverse is also true. So if, if we have silence and then sound, or we have sound and then silence, this whole kind of experience is perceived as really big to the players or to movie watchers or, or whatever. It's, it's all by design and that's what makes it really great. We don't need to do a lot of work here. The only work that we need to do is just placed around the design and that's what makes it fun for me. <laughs> Okay, so contrast and non-repetition. Um, again, this kickstarts the brainstem reflex. It maintains tension and keeps players on their toes. Because when we have something really constant, like say like dance music, there's a constant pumping beat. We just let it ride and then it becomes background noise. If we have something that is really different and not repetitive, then we are still kept on our toes because everything is changing and we can't help but keep focusing on that because again it's it's a it's a fight or flight response we we want to be safe and this is a way that we can be safe um yeah so staying in one state for prolonged periods will gradually make players immune to tension we can use this to our advantage um for example if we go into a safe room um, I'm referencing Resident Evil here. You go into a safe room and it's like really just calm tones and everything, but it's it's a it's a small short loop. So we can like become really used to it, and we we look forward to hearing just those tiny short loops because it gives players a break, and we can actually enjoy this little moment before we go out of the safe room and be terrified of what we find out there. <laughs> um, any sudden and drastic changes to this creates the deafening silence effect. Again, this is a kind of um, the same principle as before with having silence, sound or music, music and then silence. It's, it's this whole experience that creates said deafening effect. Um, so yeah. Use this to your advantage in your game audio narrative design. Um, it's just as important to give players a break from more scary bits, which will ultimately make any forthcoming scares scarier. <laughs> yep. Okay. So you need to consider the timeline. Um, so going back to my graph earlier, you you want to make sure that there is a constant ebb and flow of tension for your players or your gamers or whatever. Um, so yeah, what has happened in narrative in the previous scene highlight places to make interesting contrast points in this narrative. Um, uh, blah. 
Playing the audio a few frames ahead increases the intensity and anxiousness of the impact. The opposite encourages security and comfort. So this is a re really good nugget of information that I found whilst watching the making of in Silent Hill games. So even if it's just really like kind of minuscule, a few frames ahead or a few frames before, that does add to the overall kind of play gameplay experience. That's really cool, isn't it? So yeah, consider visuals. Okay, so remember what I said when you can like hear and see the thing that is making the thing, uh, the, the audio or not. So I really harp on a lot about Silent Hill just because they've done a really good game design for horror bits. So I don't, has, has everyone played Silent Hill here? Oh, okay. All right, so in this particular scene, it's just a really long winding road. Nothing happens. You, it's just fog. You just hear the main character's kind of footsteps happening. But then you like hear like really weird stuff happening off screen and you're like, what is this? This is like, what? what? So again, like, like because there is no music in here, I'm just listening to whatever is happening off screen here or, or over here or up there even. And like, I'm already like freaking myself out because I'm asking all these questions, basically all these questions. Um, again, so when you intentionally give players less audio sources to kind of process, that in effect makes players kind of process the whole kind of experience even more because there's a lack of information here, um, which I find really fun. Okay, so now we can kind of have a little bit of a step back and we can play with the game design. So, uh, for example, in Silent Hill 2, we have the radio static dependency. Uh, so static plays, plays interpret that as, oh, there's a monster nearby. But sometimes the game is being really trolly. Uh, the game is designed to play static and then there'll be no monsters there. So you're like, oh, I was kind of getting ready for something after all that. Or they just won't play any static and then a monster just drops in front of your face and you're like, ugh. <laughs> so even the game is working against you and that that's what that makes it part of the experience. Um, so in Undertale here, it's um, it's just a lot of bullet hells. Again, like you can hear a lot of things happening on screen, but you don't necessarily know what that particular sound source is connected to. Um, so which you know that increases anxiety, that in increases your panic, that that makes um, kind of players. On, keep, it will keep players on their toes, basically. Um, alien isolation is the saving mechanic. If you break it down, you're just saving and you need to hold your button there. And then you hear the damn thing beeping really slowly. But you can also hear what is happening off screen as well. So like there might be aliens right behind you doing their thing, like still searching for you, but you can't do anything because you must hold down the button to save the game. And this kind of like beeping is, oh, it takes ages, especially when you're really nervous and you just want to say. Um, Fatal Frame over here is a really good gameplay mechanic just because you need to take pictures of ghosts. But to do the most damage to them, you need to wait until they're right in your face um, throughout through this um, kind of uh, viewfinder here. Um, yeah, so you need to focus on the visuals here to cause the most damage, but then you can also hear a lot of stuff happening around you. So if you're stuck in a room, there might be multiple ghosts floating around you, and then you're like, well, crap, because I need to focus on one ghost to kind of like kill it, but I also need to know where the other kind of ghosties are around, otherwise they'll kill me. So, ooh, yeah, keep you on your toes. Um, Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem is is a really good one in the sense that it breaks a lot of the fourth walls. So there'll be scenes in which um, you're playing and then you just hear the volume control on your TV pop up and then kind of go down here. And then you're like, oh, that must be my TV. But actually it's not, it's, it's the game itself just playing around with your mind. Um, it probably won't work in, today, in today's TV 
um, TV screens just because it's for like the old type TVs, like the really big chunky ones. But when I played it, it was just still super cool and I wanted to chuck that in. So yeah, bonus. The science of music and the audience. Um, impact of the, of the audio in horror is very much based on the perception of the audience. So the greater the impact, the greater the game experience. Um, some examples of how music and audio is applied outside games would generally... If, oh, okay, all right. Right, so generally what I'm trying to say here is that I'm trying to take another step away from your game design or your game narrative because obviously um, the whole kind of like group of players and gamers in general, they won't necessarily experience the exact same experience when they play a game. I hope that makes sense. Because everyone has a different approach to how they, how they play a game. Everyone will have different kind of past life experience that they'll kind of bring into the game. So this is why game, this is why it's called game design because you want to, you're designing your game in a way so that the, ma the majority of the players will have essentially the same-ish kind of experience. So you, you want to like kind of have a look at the music psychology aspect. You want to look at psychoacoustics, um, sometimes music therapy and health. I've been talking a lot about how audio will make you feel really bad and crap. But on the opposite end of the scale, we can have music being used for health benefits and therapy. So obviously this is all up to you as a designer. You want to use audio to build up tension or you can use audio to make gameplay feel really nice at the end of the day. It's really, really up to you. Um, I'm bringing this back in because it's going back to my other point where I talk about contrast and non-repetition. So this is how you're going to make your game design feel really expansive and, ex and has a lot of expressions. Um, ethnomusicology is the study of music in its cultural context. So um, this is where I can talk about my gamelan and Japanese taiko drumming here because people will... If, if they've grown up with a lot of gamelan and taiko music, for example, they will have a different resonance with that type of music. If you don't, however, it's just like, oh, it's just drum, drum sounds, or it's just plinky plonky sounds or whatever. So again, if you want to look deeper into your audience perspectives, you might want to consider that for your game design if you want, if you want to um, kind of focus on a particular group of people or a particular part of cultural narrative, it, it's really up to you. But again, I'm just talking about the, so many kind of topics that kind of overlap with each other. And this is what makes it really exciting for me. And these are some just like leftover images. Um, so yeah, the point of my presentation is that if you want to like look at the core kind of game design aspect, um, there are so many little bits that you need to consider and I appreciate it, it is so hard as game designers and game makers. Um, so all in all, let the audio help you kind of com communicate your design to the players because audio is great in a way that it's automatically kind of like sub subconsciously there. You, you're not forcing players to read wall, walls of text and you're not forcing players to like kind of go through the, the tutorial levels and making sure that they pass before actually playing the game. Because sometimes you just need the audio just to tell the players like, yeah, you're doing a good job or like you're doing really badly. <laughs> oh, you, you might want to be careful here. Um, yeah, horror games um, in general, they... They can look however you want. It, it doesn't need to be like really shiny and polished like um, our Oni over here, which is a really good horror game. And I do recommend that everyone will play it if you want to see some really good, like core, basic, uh, really good game design over here. And obviously Resident Evil 4 here is, is kind of more action orientated, but they do use a lot of horror elements, which makes the gameplay really exciting. And I think that's it. Yeah, I finished. <laughs> Um, yep. Oh, no, no. Any questions? Clap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Any questions? So how does this fit in with um, dynamic audio and dynamic composition where you're fading track? Oh, right. So that one is, um, I don't know too much about that because I personally don't have experience of, of it, only like theory wise. But with dynamic audio, you basically want to kind of break each gameplay experiences into scenes, for example. So for example, you are in an era with no, com no combat mode. And then next scene would, would have uh, something like, oh, there might be some combat happening soon. You're kind of, you need to be in a like a careful danger dangerous zone over here. Then the other next scene will be like, you are actively in combat. So we can bring this kind of three different scenes back to the timeline idea that, um, that I talked about previously. And it's basically trying to figure out, okay, that timeline is more in the player's hands because they can choose to let's go into combat or let's not go into combat. So it, it really depends more of whether how like your gameplay is, is actually dynamic in that sense, or if you have more like a linear narrative progression. So I think that one is more by like a project or case by case basis, because it end of the day, it really depends on the game. But that, that theory applies there, I, I think. Yeah. Yes. How do you feel about the fashion of the brown note? <laughs> the brown note. Okay, you you mean you mean the, the really visceral kind of thing. You, you see like uh, Inception and things like that, where it's become really fashionable recently. And uh, oh, the the brown note. <laughs> Oh, I I thought you said the brown note. You mean like like well, brown brown? Well, <laughs> right? the, the weaponizing of the sound system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. So so the the bomb, <laughs> the bomb note is like um, uh, it's I think it's Hans Zimmer's kind of like that 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 is his thing to make things with like really big bombastic horns. Um, I don't know. I think that's more like I'm gonna say a musical characteristic stereotype in a way. Because whenever you hear that, you think of like, oh, epic orchestral kind of soundscapes kind of thing. Um, I mean, like, yeah, you can you can use it in your games as well if your game is like um, a really big budgeted, like high fantasy type game or, or sci-fi game even. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I yeah. Heard, the last note of Game Jam, you know, one of the ones that there was this epic soundtrack, but it was, it was literally just oh, wow. the graphic. And it was just literally the, the, the bomb note, constantly. <laughs> 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 yeah so <laughs> that, that again that, that's a really good example of like you know just playing with the audience perceptions of what they they might expect like oh like really like low-key kind of even pop music type sound with a little simple puzzle note but because they weren't expecting um, that kind of music, they they got like lots of boom notes <laughs> in their face. That I that made it fun because that experience was unexpected. So yeah, no, that that's that, that's fun. Um, the brown note, I I I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh really? Okay, I I didn't know that. They, uh, <laughs> for for people <laughs> who don't know what the brown note is, it's basically if you play a certain frequency, I think you play a certain frequency at a certain volume at people at a certain range, um, people will crap themselves. <laughs> well, I mean, like but that certain frequencies that probably make people uncomfortable. When they play yeah, yeah. I I think it's more. I don't. I don't think people like like literally drop dead onto the floor kind of thing. I don't think we have the technology to do that, and I hope we don't, because that would be terrifying. But it is a really good kind of inbuilt um, security system in which, like, you may not be able to hear it, but your body can feel it. So, like, like earthquake rumbles is a really good thing. So this is why, like, all, like, animals freak out before us humans. We'll be like, why, why is the dog kind of going mad over here? But, yeah, so that's... That's still something that we can still use, but maybe more in a cinema setting with really big stereo systems. Uh, yeah. Yes? <laughs> um, have you played the game Tower Sangre? No, I haven't. It's a mobile game is just audio. Oh, okay. I will play it then. <laughs> it's, uh, it's binaural audio, so you take steps by tapping on the screen, take steps and things. Oh, okay. Game play audio. I will play it soon, and I will ask for you for the... um. 
the title, how to write it down properly. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you.